I guess while people are sitting, you're seeing this loop of, uh, of two sessions, the, the cl closing of the meeting of the committee of the whole in Rome at about, I think, 10 o'clock or, or, or 10.30 or something on Friday night, uh, the 17th of July, 1998. And then the governments uh, in that meeting uh, voted uh, twice against amendments, uh, first from uh, the United States and India, and and uh, took no action, and the treaty was agreed to uh, in the Committee of the Whole, and the United States uh, insisted, uh, which was one of the strangest requests, but anyway, that there, there would be a vote in the plenary an unrecorded vote. And the unrecorded vote in the plenary was 120 to 7. But I think of any of us that were in the room, in, in the committee of the whole room that evening, uh, have probably never before or since experienced the kind of outburst uh, from a thousand lawyers uh, for the adoption of the of the Rome Statute. It went on for, uh, I think, 20, 30 minutes. It was an extraordinary. I wasn't in Paris uh, for the climate agreement a couple of years ago, but I can't imagine this was a, this a, a, a seared in, a, I think, all of our lives of those of us that were participating in, in Rome that evening. I think people knew that they had created uh, history. So. Well, I think we can stop the loop and we'll start the uh, afternoon two sessions. The first on assessing the Rome statute system 20 years out, challenges to progress in the fight against impunity in today's geopolitical landscape. And then after coffee uh, at uh, uh, 1530, we will have a closing session on the future of the Rome statute system, the International Criminal Court, and international justice. And I think in some ways both of these sessions, but certainly the third session, is all wrapped up with a theme that kept coming up yesterday and today on this uh, crisis that we are experiencing with the retreat from multilateralism uh, happening in many regions of the world and how will this affect and how should the Assembly of State Parties and the, and the International Criminal Court uh, and civil society uh, respond to, to it. In session two, we're asking what are the successes and shortfalls of the of foundational elements of the Rome Statute and the ICC on cooperation, non-cooperation, complementarity, victims, universality, legal representation, amendments. Assessing what this for over the, the last 20 years. Assessing the main organs of the Rome Statute system, the prosecutor, judiciary, registry, the office of the presidency, trust fund for victims, Assembly of State Parties and its Secretariat. Uh, how is the court weathering the political opposition uh, that, it, that has arisen and, and difficulties? I don't think saying, that we, I think we didn't phrase it properly here, it's not really the UN that's opposing it, but they're within the UN, within the Security Council, uh, and uh, there is uh, serious difficulties in their uh, referring the matter and then not assisting with, with uh, enforcing their referral. Um, and we are delighted to have uh, three very distinguished uh, uh, panelists. Uh, and I am again hopeful that we will be able to have uh, presentations and then we'll allow at least uh, two thirds of the time for uh, the participation of, of or for participants to, to intervene as we did this morning, either with a handheld microphone or at one of the microphones in the front of the room. Um, and if you can just be sure to try and get my attention, I try to look so that I can try and keep a list of, of, of those of you that would be willing to intervene. Our uh, first uh, presenter, and that's Second, I have lost. It's, it's very simple. 
is Dr. David Danat Kitin, uh, who is the Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action and an organization that has been at the forefront during ratification and now implementation and further ratification campaigns. Um, David <laughs> was one of the great uh, youth leaders uh, in the development of the Rome statute system. He would show up in New York at the UN with 17 uh, European Law Students Association delegates uh, and uh, of course was was extremely valuable in Rome in, in, in the heading teams for the, for the coalition in Rome and has just been done I think a spectacular job uh, as Secretary General of PGA. So, David. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here um, as maybe the only person born in Rome who was a team leader of uh, the CICC teams uh, during the five weeks of the Rome conference and now 20 years after the only speaker in the or agenda who was born in Rome. And uh, it's the Rome statute, it's not the wrong statute, okay? And, but it was done at a time in which the same problems that we are encountering today were alive and kicking. It was done with seven votes against, called by the United States of America, okay? It was done in a climate where we would have forecasted that as soon as there would have been an arrest warrant against a sitting head of state, what is happening would have happened. So let's not be naive. Everything that is in the Rome Statute was, was forecasted to be confronted with the hard reality that we are confronted with today. And the more problems the court has, the more it has successes. I was really wondering, uh, back in the first years of the ratification campaign, why things were going so smoothly. It was really shocking to me. I remember having worked with the Côte d'Ivoire parliamentarians before that the war started there, uh, to try to see if there was a possibility of, of any peace agreement or any constitutional change to, to bring back uh, a uh, certain leader uh, from in, in ineligibility. Well, then the war started, the Security Council intervened, the, the French uh, uh, made a very important operation to divide uh, the two sides. And we continued to work in 2001, 2002, 2003 with Côte d'Ivoire to get them to ratify their own statute and also accept the jurisdiction of the court so that the court could exercise jurisdiction on the crime. And we were really surprised that they, everybody was supporting our demarches. But one day, finally, it was 2004, I received a phone call from a member of parliament from Côte d'Ivoire who tells me, David, la Cour pénale internationale n'est plus pas dans l'intérêt de la paix, nous ne la soutenons pas. We don't support anymore the court, the court is not uh, anymore in the interest of peace. And I was so happy, I was so happy that day, because it's finally the court is making a difference. This guy is so close to the, at that time, President Bagbo that he must have realized that his principal can be prosecuted. Bingo! This is a real court. <laughs> okay, so we measure the success of the court with the troubles of the court. That's what we are doing here. The problem is that this is a consensual court because we there is not yet a rule of law, and uh, I, I really praise the work of Hans Corel uh, in that uh, realm. We need an international rule of law. We don't have it because the states are the subject of the law. They are the legislators. They, are, they have the executive power through the Security Council, and they even have appointed so far their own judges and approving their own litigation at the ICJ and other arbitration fora. This is the first court that once you give to it jurisdiction, as we have it regionally with the EU and in other systems, that's it, it's automatic. Am I right? More or less, it is. You can still withdraw, but it will not have retroactive value. So for President Duterte, it's too late to withdraw if, for example, there would be a case relating to him for situations that happened two, three, four, five years ago. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, we want universality because without universality there is no jurisdiction based on territory or active nationality. Am I right or not? Or we depend on the Security Council and we don't want to depend on the Security Council because the Security Council is selective. It will do a tribunal for Rwanda and not for Burundi. 
That was the main reason why, when I was a student with the European Law Students Association in Arusha, at the openings of the Akayesu trial, we were organizing the Arusha School on International Criminal Law, International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, we said we need a permanent court because it's absolutely unfair that what is happening for Rwanda is not happening for the victims of the Burundian massacres. Burundi is now the only state that has withdrawn out of an history of impunity. So um, uh, the court is there to stay and it, it, it's there to fight. And the main outcome of this morning and yesterday's session, and I, I'm just adding something that others have been saying, but I would like to say it very straightforward. What is missing today in this court that we know and that we fight for is a strategic, proactive approach to how to move cases forward. Because uh, we have seen it, how the Kenya uh, cases have collapsed. These two individuals, who were not elected officials, were allowed, on a summons to voluntary appear, to move back home and rally their entire country behind them and against the court. Has there been a lesson learned exercise to say, this cannot happen anymore? Of course, uh, Mr. Hans Corell's opinion is much more important than mine, and he has he's published about that. But I remember vividly telling uh, in the old days of the first meetings uh, facilitated by the CICC with the organs of the court, is it, is it really correct that for two cases relating to 1,300 people being slaughtered and several other thousands being uh, either raped, tortured, or, or detained, and so on, we have these people allowed to go back home? Will they not kill the witnesses and victims? Isn't this what President Duterte or others are planning to do today, tomorrow, and after tomorrow? Haven't they the power to control their territory and mastermind plans to destroy this court? Its credibility, its effectiveness, its capacity. I think they have. I work with members of parliament who are sometimes selfishly supportive of the court. Why is that? Because they don't like some of their rulers, and they believe maybe the court, as any other court, can have an important role in maybe what, sooner or later getting us rid of from uh, whoever we have uh, that is ruling uh, our states. This is the geopolitical landscape. So we, but we need to know, we need to be aware that there are those who are idealists, who believe in the rule of law, in justice and human rights, those who will be instrumentally participating in a in a conference and supporting uh, joining the Rome Statute and so on. That's the reality in which we live. There is no positive complementarity. Complementarity is a negative concept. It was crafted in Article 19, 17 and 1 as a protection to national sovereignty. That was the agreement. We don't want the court to handle our own business when we are able to do so. That was the ratio behind the drafting, and uh, you will hear from one of the major, if we have a, a definition of Article 7 that, that is as good as we have it today, it's also thanks to, to Daryl, who, 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 who chaired those, those negotiations. I was not in the closed doors of the negotiation. I can tell you only what I heard from delegates uh, that know much more than me. But my understanding is that there is no such thing as positive complementarity. Yet, there is a duty of states to prevent genocide to bring to justice all perpetrators of war crimes under the Geneva Conventions. The same they have to do under the Torture Convention. Then there is a Convention Against Forced uh, Disappearances. Then there is what, something that we call customary international law, which Judge Cassese wrote into the historic Tadic decision in 1995, that basically brought about uh, uh, this body of law to life, again, after Nuremberg. And, uh, well, under customary international, you can say that if you're serious about preventing and punishing crimes against humanity, you have to adjudicate those who commit crimes against humanity. So you have a duty to prosecute. There is a duty to prosecute. Let's call it positive complementarity. It's fine for me. I don't have any problem with the name or not the name. But the reality is another, that complementarity is a way for states to say, well, this is a court of last resort. The reality is that in so many states in which there is no political will to exercise the duty to prosecute, to prosecute, this is the only court of resort. And victims do not see any other open justice than 
in the International Criminal Court. I'm not saying that this is right or, or wrong. I'm not saying that I'm happy or I, I, allow, I, agree, I agree with this position, but that's the reality. We need, to conf we need to look at the landscape in which we operate. So what are we doing proactively to change the landscape and to make sure that, for example, arrest warrants will be effective? Well, one of the things that I've been saying, and you have Article 68, Paragraph 1, uh, that allows us to have a, a legal argument to, pro to promote this idea, is that we need to do whatever we can, all organs of the court, all member states that are bound to the, to the statute, we need to make sure that there is not what we will call secondary or double victimizations. We don't want that on account of cases or investigations or preliminary examinations, there will be new or more victims. We would like, ideally, in an ideal world, as our friends from Congo have said, we would like to have prevention, deterrence. And we might have had some deterrence in some cases that have been also scientifically documented. Maybe in other cases we didn't have any prevention whatsoever, but that's the history of uh, criminal law. You cannot really prove what didn't happen, and, and that's what prevention is. However, we absolutely don't want that because the court is announcing something, somebody will be killed or will disappear. So that's my point here, is that maybe some announcements, some publicity given to some preliminary examinations or even other st steps that have been taken could have been avoided in the name of this proactive uh, strategy to then get a trial ready case to be served one and if, once and if there will be the evidence to, to issue uh, arrest warrants and hopefully to also execute them. Uh, I see Bill telling me to finish, of course. Um, what I, I want to conclude with is really with a positive statement here. Of course, there are many, many problems facing the Rome Statute system. But without the Rome Statute system, there wouldn't be a potentially universal origin or a barrier against impunity, which is still rampant. But 20 years ago, impunity was the rule and accountability or justice was the remote exception for victor's justice in some exercises, for the idea of some um, equal justice, like in the former Yugoslavia conflict. Uh, but it was very selective. It was really ad hoc. The idea that we have a permanent international criminal court is still fundamental. It's still a fundamental starting point to launch again a global campaign for justice, the rule of law, and the fight against impunity, with the view that one day those crimes should be and will be prevented. We need to stay optimistic. And there is no alternative to this. It's not about reopening the statute. It's about maximizing our small and limited resources, being more strategic, and going to the offense. There is so much to be learned. Not only, I, I heard to, today a lot about the EU accession, enlargement process, and the conditionalities to Croatia, Serbia. Serbia is not yet in the EU. So, I mean, that's, that's true, that uh, analysis, Richard, and, and so on, it's, it's true, and it's, it's certainly very important to be made, and that those things will not replicate. But also, what we have seen in that uh, season that brought about the arrest, for example, of Slobodan Milosevic, was a very proactive prosecutor coming out with very anti-diplomatic statements that basically oblige the international community to either side with her or be against her. So we need to maybe look back at those examples and maybe it's time for having that type of uh, dynamics to be reinstalled. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, next we have uh, Lorraine Smith Van Lynn. Uh, Lorraine is the post-conflict justice advisor at Redress, an active organization within the coalition which works for obtaining uh, justice for torture vic victims and uh, leads our victims' rights working group. Uh, she worked for several years as a prosecutor and parish court judge in Jamaica, and then for years we knew her as the director of the International Bar Association's International Criminal Court uh, Program. So, Lorraine. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very difficult to follow David, but I promise that I will be very short, and deliberately so, 
because there are colleagues in the room who know far more about these issues than I could ever hope to. There are colleagues who are members of the Victims' Rights Working Group, including my colleagues who are here from FIDH, from Human Rights Watch. There are so many colleagues who could speak to these issues because they have been on the ground. They have been meeting with witnesses, with victims in Burundi, in the Central African Republic. We heard from our former director, Carla Firstman, yesterday, and she championed the cause of victims. And so for the three minutes that I have been allotted, I also would like to do that. And I'd like to start by reminding us about the purpose of victims and why victims are part of the Rome Statute system. It might not be necessary to say this in an audience like this, but I think it's important. The word victims appears 120 times in the rules of procedure and evidence and 40 times in the, word, in the Rome Statute. But it is not just a mere symbolic, theoretical, paper notion. Victims are real people with real needs and they are expecting of the Rome Statute system that these needs will be met. The question is whether the ICC, as we know it, as it has evolved from Rome, and I was not there, is able to meet that challenge. Victims are central to the Rome Statute system, something that should never be forgotten. In fact, the rights afforded to victims, which include participation in proceedings, protection, support, as well as reparations, are not theoretical, but beyond that, civil society organizations such as Redress and others that I've mentioned fought tirelessly to ensure that international standards governing victims' rights were included in the normative framework of the Rome Statute. This was in order to ensure that the, Rome, that the ICC would be an institution that would make a real difference for victims of the worst crimes. We've seen some successes, and I want to be very clear in highlighting them. We've seen that victims have been able to give their accounts, and those accounts form part of the historical, the permanent historical record of the court, and that is important. I can recall an interview that we did, that Redress did some years ago in the Access magazine, a publication that um, the Victims' Rights Working Group put out um, with judge, former ICC Judge Rene Blattman. He was in the Labanga case. And he pointed out that trial chamber one was not able to go to the DRC, but by having victims tell their stories, by having victims appear, the DRC came to the court. And I think it's, it is really critical as we have the dialogue today that we, we not lose sight of the fact that victims have made a difference in actual proceedings before the court. In the Lubanga case, for example, there was an issue with names. Victims' contribution was essential in helping the chamber understand the origin of Congolese names, which had become an issue during some witnesses' testimonies. Other positives, we've seen much effort by the court to improve processes for victim engagement and to develop policies and practices that take victims' needs and rights into account. The Office of the Prosecutor, for example, in 2010, drafted a policy paper on victim participation, reiterating that office's support for victims and the rights enjoyed under the statute. More importantly, the, and I wouldn't say importantly, but more recently, after considerable effort, the 17-page application form, which I will refer to later, was later reduced to seven, and it has now become one page. And this is also reflected in the Chamber's practice manual. But the process has not always been smooth, and this is where I don't want to emphasize this, but I want it to be discussed. While the raison d'etre of victim involvement with the court is relatively clear, the reality was that the normative framework was less so. Victims, the term victims was not defined by the Rome Statute, and that was left for the rules of procedure and evidence. And the judges then had to determine the framework, 
modalities of participation, the scope. That meant that we, we have seen a lot of judicial disparity in approaches. Let me put it that way. So much was vague that it was entirely left to, to judicial determination. And I put myself in the shoes of the judge, coming from a common law background where the idea of victim participation is, is not known to us at all. It would be difficult for the judges to interpret exactly what victim participation should look like. And while the court has made great effort to interpret these rights in a manner which enables victims to meaningfully rather than symbolically engage with the court, the practice has been characterized by inconsistent judicial decisions and divergent practice in key areas such as the modalities of participation and legal representation. In addition to divergent judicial approaches, administrative challenges have also hampered the effectiveness of participation at the court. As one victims expert um, noted, the victims became documents, forms, statistics, and their personalities were almost forgotten. And the application process in particular became burdensome on chambers, the registry parties, and created significant backlogs. Going forward, we know the problems. I think all of us sitting here are well aware of the problems. But going forward, what should be the priorities? I'll tell you some of my thoughts. Access. When we speak to victims, one of the single greatest challenges they have is access to information about the court, court's proceedings. Public information and outreach, sadly, has simply been one of the most underfunded areas at the court. And if we cannot reach to victims who are in rural communities who need to hear what is happening at the ICC about their own cases, if we do not fund legal representatives and their legal assistants on the ground and ensure that they have enough resources to be able to engage with their clients, then there is going to be a major gap. There is also need to ensure that even if we simplify the application form and it is only one page, that it is translated into the language of victims and it is posted in a timely manner on the court's website. The other issue is legal representation. Tensions remain about the interpretation of Rule 90, and, well, the application, how it should be applied. Should victims have the right to free choice of counsel or should judges in a top-down manner determine what is most appropriate when we talk about common legal representation? And reparations, and I end with that. Make the reparations process genuinely meaningful for victims, both in terms of the process for establishing the nature and extent of the harm, and by ensuring timely and effective implementation of reparation orders. So far, we have seen a case-by-case -case approach and inconsistency. We have also noted tensions between the trust fund's understanding of its role and the chamber's interpretation of that role. Ultimately, for the trust fund to be effective, it must have both financial resources and in-house expertise in order to carry out its functions. State support is critical to all of this. States must also reiterate their support for the centrality of victims at the ICC, and issues concerning them should be seen through the lens of restorative justice rather than purely budget and expediency. And I just want to pause to say, to highlight um, how, how valuable and how important it is to see initiatives such as that initiated by the government of Ireland in respect of the planned mission to the northern region of Uganda. It is, it is critical that states are brought to where the victims are, to see the work of the trust fund in action and to be able to engage directly with victims and victim communities. And I close with this. Victims do not only seek to obtain something through the criminal justice process. They add value to it. And it is important for us to make this happen. 
for their sake. Thank you very much. Our th third presenter to open this session uh, was a member of the Canadian delegation uh, in Rome. He was also very young at the time, I believe. He then came to work in the early years of the International Criminal Court and now for a number of years has been a professor uh, of international law in Canada, uh, Daryl Robertson. Um, hi, friends. Um, I want to talk about something a little bit different, um, something external to the court, which is the cooperation, sorry, the, um, the communications environment that the court works in. And I want to suggest to you that the environment itself warrants our concern and our attention and our actions. Um, studies show how conversations can snowball and cascade. And uh, there's a real danger that under certain conditions, they can reach a, uh, a tipping point and become, uh, they can go to negative extremes. Um, I want to preface what I'm about to say. I'm not saying that criticism of the court is bad. Of course, fact-based, substantiated, thoughtful criticisms are welcome, and we have to listen uh, very careful to them, carefully to them. But my concern is that the ICC today, it's being drowned in criticisms, uh, which aren't fact-based. They're superficial often, and they're contradictory. And um, the consequences of this are quite real. Um, the ICC, obviously, it's a normative symbol. Perceptions of its legitimacy determine its clout and its support and ultimately its effectiveness. Um, if any of what I'm saying sounds alarmist, um, let's remember that in the United Kingdom, um, the United Kingdom was saturated with false claims about European Union regulations and then in a very tight referendum they voted for Brexit. So false claims have real uh, consequences. Um, why are things different for the ICC than they were for others? Why are they so difficult? I have four thoughts. One, people have alluded to this already, the geopolitical context is different. The 90s, the tribunals, there was a time of relative geopolitical unity. So today, as we all already know, it's more chaotic, it's more fractured. There's isolationism, suspicion of any international um, efforts. Um, number two, uh, technology. I think now the first exposure lots of people have to any ICC decision comes from a blog. And that particular medium encourages sensationalist and scathing commentary because that's what attracts eyeballs and clicks and attention. So that's going to shape perceptions of the court in, in a new way. Um, three, I think academia has changed. Um, academics were pretty supportive of the tribunals, but today the fashion of academics is to show they're all independent thinking, and they, to do that, they castigate and condemn the ICC, which ironically is not that independent if you're doing what everybody else does. We'll set that aside. Um, but most academics don't really have an incentive to correct those kinds of errors, so that conversation, the academic conversation, without error correction, it also gets more and more lopsided. And then the fourth one is that, yes, persons under scrutiny have resources like we haven't seen before to launch uh, very sophisticated um, uh, distraction campaigns. So um, Kenyatta hired a British PR firm called BPI. They did a great job. Uh, th they developed a lot of the lines about neocolonial attack that are still dominating the discourse today. So they've managed between killers and the ICC have made the ICC the bad guys. Um, so, um, what should you do? What can we do? My suggestion is, I, I mean, I call on you to call out certain patterns in the conversation. The main pattern that worries me, um, and this isn't even on the sinister side, this is even among supporters, is the ICC has all these contradictory requirements. People invoke opposite values and they judge and condemn the court according to the opposite things it's supposed to be always doing. Um, and some of you have heard me talk about this before, inescapable dyads, but the ICC is criticized for reaching too high, um, which means it's grandstanding and overreaching and that's quote political. It's at the same time criticized for reaching too low, which is cowardly and craven and therefore political. Um, it's, it's criticized for being too imperious, it's intervening and imposing its own agenda, not listening to others, and that's political. 
and it's simultaneously criticized for listening too much to others and is being too deferential and that's inappropriate and that's political. And I have a million of these examples, but the court is, it's, it's too close to states, it's too far from states, it's intervening too soon and too late and it's going too slow and it's going too fast and there's all these diets like that. <laughs> and what I want you to notice is that when you hear these criticisms, they all sound plausible because they're all invoking a value that's a good value. And people hear them one at a time and they're left with a negative impression of the court. And what I suggest to us is that we um, recognize and point out these tensions. And when someone's making a criticism based on one value to point out that this is a multi-dimensional complicated problem and all the solutions are kind of bad and, uh, and we should give some room to the court. The other pattern to point out is there's a really casual tendency now to ascribe any decision of the ICC to call it political. And, uh, and I just want, uh, I mean, the word political, I don't know what this word means anymore, but it seems to mean about 100 things. Um, and uh, young people today, when they first hear of the ICC, they hear 100 voices telling them the ICC is political. And it sounds like a unified chorus. But I think what we should expose and disentangle, that's not a unified chorus. That's a hundred voices pulling in different directions and that this is actually what should be a healthy um, uh, debate. So that's it, I will end there. Um, I just wanna, yes, so my points are, <laughs> beware that conversations can cascade. It won't matter what the operational successes of the court are if global audiences have been conditioned to only see failures. Um, so what do we take away from that? When we, supporters of the court, make criticisms, we should try to acknowledge that it's not simple, there's trade-offs. We're all very passionate, but we shouldn't insist on having our own vision prevail, and we should give room to the court to interpret its own uh, statute. And uh, I think we should all try to expose these patterns and fallacies I've talked about so we can try to build a, a healthier conversation about the court. Uh, thank you all. Cheers. Well, uh, thank you, three very uh, provocative, uh, I think, interventions, and now we want to go to the participants, and as in the morning, we will uh, either do handheld microphones to you or have you come to one of the, uh, one of the speaker stands. Um, I'm interested, in a way, in the very last, uh, the, the either contradictions or paradoxes that you You've, you, you've experienced. One that I'm surprised in two days hadn't yet been raised is the widespread perception and complaint that international justice, whether it's whatever kind of tribunal, ad hoc, special, whatever, has been taking vastly too long from the point of the uh, responsibility of a jurisdiction to through the appeals, etc. And at the same time, in Justice uh, Lorraine's uh, 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 presentation, to get reparations right, <laughs> to get the legal representation and issues correct, it's going to still take time. And, uh, and I think then uh, uh, David and Daryl were all both talking about how we need to be uh, supporters and critical and constructively critical supporters, but that there aren't any easy answers. Uh, uh, President uh, Fernandez at this ex wonderful award ceremony for the other night was talking about the, um, just the, the difficulties that, uh, uh, that being president, when you have different chambers coming up with different procedures, different rulings, uh, legal, system chauvinism, all, all of this, that you have a newly elected judges have to go through a similar length of time while they actually learn the, the procedures of the court and the ways of the court. So I think uh, this session on assessing and uh, the, the different uh, elements of, the, of, the, of uh, the, the ICC and the Rome statute system is going to be, I think, one of the most uh, Difficult and interesting ones. Uh, I know I, I, uh, uh, FIDH, uh, Amal, uh, we'll start with you and, and the others, as I said, if you will give me your 
your attention with your hands and we will do our best to uh, have people. Okay, well, just a second, let me sit down again. And then I'll feel, if everyone will introduce themselves and their organization, if there's an organization. Is it on? Yeah. Um, thank you, Bill, for giving me uh, the mic. Just to briefly introduce myself, because I don't think everybody knows me, uh, I have just joined um, the FIDH, the International Federation for Human Rights, as their representative to the ICC. We are, of course, a member of the coalition um, for, for the ICC, and uh, therefore I would like to thank you for the organization of the event. And I would like to also thank the panelists. Um, it has been very interesting. Um, since yesterday and even the weeks before, we have been discussing and assessing the first 20 years of the Rome Statute and the challenges that the court has faced um, thus far. And we have indeed established that the court has faced the issue of non-cooperation from its state's party. But as Professor uh, Robinson has just noted, that the political um, or the geopolitical landscape is changing and will continue to change. Um, and therefore, uh, that brings me to the point that I want to, um, to, to discuss, or I want us to discuss or start thinking about, which is um, the fact that in the next 20 years, the challenge is likely to be that the court will have investigation or will likely move on to investigate situations and crimes committed in regions that remain underrepresented um, in, the, in the Rome statute system, such as the Middle East and Asia as a whole. Um, and for that, I would like to um, just pose the question uh, of, I mean, for, for us, civil society organizations, but also for the International Co uh, Criminal Court, of what are we doing to galvanize support from states that are not yet party to the Rome statutes? And if we don't start working on that now, what support is the court going to have if it has an investigation in Afghanistan or in Palestine or if more inv investigations in this region are opened? Um, I think we need to start thinking of how um, we can develop cooperative ties uh, with these states that are non-state parties, but also with CSOs, civil society organizations, including grassroots organizations in these countries, uh, to make the court more relevant to them. Because I know that the normal answer is, okay, we need them to ratify their own statute, but it is unlikely that states and civil society organizations push for that because they don't see the relevance of that yet. And therefore, I would like us to start thinking together of how we can make it relevant to them and how we can start bringing them closer to the Rome Statute system. Thank you very much. Can I see some of the hands of those who are interested in, in intervening? And I'm going to try and rotate this through. Uh, uh, different kinds of sectors, but uh, the former legal director from Denmark, who I'd like to. Yeah, thank you. If, if I may go, yeah, my name is Thu Lehmann, and I was former uh, legal advisor in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark. I would like to go back a little bit on the history and say my own contribution to the establishment of the Economic Court has been very modest indeed. And I did take part in the Rome uh, conference, but uh, we had a, a, a turning point, I would say, in 1995, uh, where I happened to be chairman of the Sixth Committee in New York that was uh, at the General Assembly's 50th anniversary. And we were faced with this uh, problem about how to move forward with the idea of uh, convening or the idea of establishing the criminal court. At the time, we had an ad hoc committee debating endlessly whether to have such a court and, and all sorts of problems. It's like, as you know, lawyers can be divided into two groups, those who seek solutions to all problems and those who see problems in all solutions. I prefer to be the part of the first group of lawyers. But anyway, uh, we managed there at the time to move from the ad hoc committee 
to consider whether and so on and so forth, to establish a preparatory committee for convening a conference to establish a criminal court, not to uh, consider whether to convene, but to uh, convene a conference and by in so doing uh, accepting the generous offer by the Italian government to host uh, that conference. The resolution was of course uh, controversial so no sponsors, no, no state would like to sponsor it so uh, the chair had to sponsor it, <coughs> I had to sponsor it and it was uh, adopted by consensus happily which was not the case all the time. But now to the point about challenges ahead, and here I would like very shortly to once again relate to the question, or to, to raise the question about the relationship between uh, the ICC and the Security Council. It's uh, well known, I believe, that in the Charter, in Article 36, uh, it states that the Council, whenever debating means of resolving in an international dispute should bear in mind the prin in principle to refer such cases to the International Court of Justice. That's our, our neighbor here to the right. And uh, I think that principle should also apply when the Council is considering crimes against humanity. It would be most uh, obvious that uh, in situation where there's no national jurisdiction taking place, that the court should remember this principle about referring such cases to the International uh, Criminal Court. And uh, here I believe that the NGO community and the state parties to the Rome Statute, uh, they have, or they should make this point over and again. We could say it in this way, time is up, for the permanent file to show solidarity with the victims of crimes of, against humanity. Thank you. So I think we'll go to a, a court representative, uh, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Technically speaking, I'm not a court representative. I represent the ah, technically. I represent the Trust Fund for Victims, which is a subsidiary body of the state's parties, but closely associated with the court. And that's something I'd like to highlight also in my intervention. Um, I thank Lorraine for mentioning the Trust Fund for Victims, the work that we do with reparations. Um, you highlighted the challenges. I would like to highlight actually what we are achieving. Um, there are challenges. We are eating the challenges as they emerge, I can tell you. Uh, right now, we are implementing reparations. Uh, there's nothing really much I can tell about that, but it's ongoing. I think that is a real milestone of the Rome Statute. Um, and it is something that should be celebrated. It's not easy to imagine reparations. Um, and if they are being imagined, that needs to be done together with victims. And I think that's important to also to realize that the whole engagement by the Rome Statute system with victims is not the responsibility of one part of the court or one part of the system. It's a continuum in which um, in which all um, organs play a role. From the beginning, where um, situations are opened, where VPRS is engaging with victims already, right until the end, uh, until the implementation and delivery of reparations awards. And I do think that this um, Rome Statute system and the reparative function of that system is uh, one of the big new challenges um, Coming out from the death right now, this can be coming visible, uh, and people are scared, saying, you can't do that. It's security, the security problems and everything. I think solutions can be found. We are finding solutions. We are working um, on the implementation of reparations in areas where there are security problems. It can be done. And if you don't have one solution uh, working, you may find another one. That kind of adaptability, I think, is built into the system and, and needs to be used. Um, it doesn't come for free. Um, it needs resources, that's been mentioned by Lorraine also, but it can be done. Uh, and I do think that the bottom line of international uh, criminal justice is the value put to it by uh, the victims at the end of the day. What kind of value was delivered to them through this system, through um, judgments, decisions, convictions, uh, but also through reparations awards which uh, are delivered to their doorstep, not in the, on the courtroom only. 
So that is my plea um, to this audience. If they think about um, what has been achieved, um, we're only at the beginning. Um, there's this story about um, a visit of a, an American journalist to China in the 70s, uh, asking the question to one of China's leaders, what has been the impact of the French Revolution? And the answer was, well, it's too early to tell. I think that is, this may not be true, but it, it is, I think it's the same kind of um, perspective that we need to maintain that while uh, a lot has happened already, a lot has been achieved, uh, a lot still can uh, be envisaged for the next few years, that requires uh, a continued belief in a value system that may seem to be under attack but I think is more resilient uh, than many might uh, seem to think, uh, and especially in those countries uh, where uh, we are working with victims, victims' communities, where there are expectations, where there are needs, but also where we can have uh, I think a fertile ground for a white based approach to reparative justice. Thank, thank you. <coughs> I'm going to go to, uh, well, an NGO that Deborah. Thank you, Vio. I speak on my personal capacity. I had the pleasure of working uh, for Parliamentarians for Global Action and also being part as a staff member of Parliamentarians for Global Action of the Coalition of the International Criminal Court and later on at the ICC. Um, I think my intervention, my comment to the panel and to the participants, which I'm very happy to see after having um, distanced myself slightly from the work of the ICC directly, is um, as we are assessing on the panel, uh, very interestingly, assesses the challenges. Uh, David spoke about the political and the strategic issues. Lorraine talks about the victims, and Daryl has talked about the general public and these, the perceptions and how those perceptions impact. And I want to echo uh, what Effie Deash has said. Um, as you are convening us here, Bill, uh, to, to work here, and I have had a chance of working now at other institutions that don't benefit from the privilege of an organized constituency of civil society and individuals working towards a common goal. That we don't take that for granted, and as Effie Deash said, you know, really think about what is the role of civil society in this regard. Um, and studying and looking at the impact that civil society has had is very important. Highlighting first the challenges that civil society is facing at the moment, the attacks against human rights defenders around the world, which are seriously threatening um, the, the sustainability of, of communities, uh, the financial um, precarity in which civil society organizations are being left at the moment by the main donors around the world who are uh, burdening civil society organizations with huge administrative costs over small numbers of, um, of staff to be able to run and compete for very limited resources. Uh, diversion of resources uh, for civil society. So taking in consideration those realities and, and really looking at it, civil society is not only the grassroots level, I mean, it's, it's composed very importantly by the grassroots level in Afghanistan, as the has mentioned, or by the victims' organizations or by the local members that compose the CICC. But the civil society organizations have actually managed to have great achievements at the very high levels of decision making, making sure that delegates like those participating in the Security Council had the right information or were able to benefit from institutional knowledge and institutional memory that go to parliaments and make sure that opposing members of, of the political spheres talk to each other. So, I mean, it, it is, my, my intervention is really to highlight that, uh, to, re, to re, um, maybe uh, request a reaction from the panel on, on their perceptions on that level and to thank uh, the CICC for having created really um, you know, a space for individuals to grow personally, to bring those experiences to other areas, and to, and to maybe moving into what is the new direction for the coalition, what is the new direction for the civil society and for the individuals, uh, because having the capacity of convening this community um, should not be taken for granted. It doesn't exist in other areas, and are, I think that is an essential contribution to the successes of the court and to anything that can be brought back to the victims. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Judge Monaghan. Thank you very much, um, Bill. Um, first of all, I would like to 
thank the CICC for its support to the court. Throughout the nine years I've been a judge at the ICC, one thing that I have always known to be certain, to be as certain as sunrise, is the seminars that um, you have held internally with the ICC. And I'm saying this very, very honestly, because it was during those seminars that you were honest to us, and you asked us to be honest to you. And I can assure you that uh, those seminars really strengthened us and strengthened our relationship with you. Within the next few um, days, I'll be a former judge of the ICC, and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you and to wish you and your constituents the best of luck. Having said that, um, <laughs> being a member of the court and at one time having been a vice president of the court, I feel like there is a little bit of divide. Maybe divide is too strong a word to use. There is a gap between the court and our principals, states parties. I feel like um, we should not be meeting over, only over formal issues like the budget once a year or preparations for the budget for this, for that. I have a feeling and I have some, some diplomats have said to me, we just wish there could be a time when we sit with the court as a family, we are not discussing any formalities. We want to know and to understand and to appreciate what the court is really about. And my mind goes back to the conversations this morning where we, we have aspirations and I ascribe to that for the court to be known even in our own countries. If our principals, maybe through um, ambassadors, don't really know what we are about, and with the greatest of respect, ambassadors come and go. I mean, I cannot imagine how many, for instance, South African ambassadors I've gone through. I'll say South Africa because I'm basically a South African. I've gone through ever since I came here for nine years. And my question to the panel, or to anybody, what can we do to bring these two parties who are actually hand and glove nearer to each other? And um, I th uh, to the panel, there's a question about um, how the ICC is, um, is going over poli the, the political dimension. Especially, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight the EU because I'm an African. I don't know. Uh, I would like, I'm going out there, we are going out there now. We need to, 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 to contribute to this conversation uh, with, um, with flexibility because now we won't be held by any <laughs> ethics of the ICC. Please help us. I, I, I mean, I'm a, I, I will remain a judge of the ICC until I die. I will have the, <laughs> the interests of this institution for as long as I live. And as so-called maybe senior members of the African continent, we want to know how we can help. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And Two responses quickly to you. One, uh, uh, this, the Judge Monaghan is from Botswana, and Botswana has been a small state that has been a tower of strength for the court. It, at times, the only country standing up against uh, the dictators and presidents for life and accused uh, uh, presidents. Uh, in the African Union format and uh, and over and over and over again in the last two days and all these years, the role that small states have played 
in the Rome statute system has never been properly revealed and written about and documented. It has been instrumental and enormous, and et cetera. And, and we definitely need to find ways to keep the kind of expertise and, 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 the, and the gravitas of, of the leadership that judges, actually former judges like you can present. On the consultative arrangements with the, with the court, again, uh, with, without the first uh, leaders of the court agreeing to the Assembly of State Parties request that the kind of consultative arrangements that we had with the assembly, that the court would embrace them, uh, that has made all of the difference. And they're not really seminars. There are we call them roundtables uh, annually, but it is it it is an extraordinary uh, me mechanism. If we had that kind of thing with the Department of Peacekeeping Operations or Humanitarian Affairs or other organs of the UN. I promise you there would be uh, improvements uh, in, 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 in those activities. So uh, I, I, and we were very pleased after, we didn't originally meet with the judges because of the independence, but the judges requested that they have meetings well, we, we with us. We requested too, we requested too, I requested. Too. The, the PGA requested, but uh, the Every coalition time. didn't request because we thought we, we wanted to wait till the judges asked us, and they did. And we now, for the last four years, have been have, have been uh, having those bilateral meetings, and and, and it's I think uh, very important. Uh, next, if I could, I'll call on uh, the yes, please. I have six or seven additional people, and so. Uh, we'll keep going and then we'll do answers from the panels toward the end. Hello, Janet Anderson. I'm a journalist working on the court um, and a number of other international justice affairs. I wanted to um, thank Professor Robinson for his uh, comments uh, and agree with him that it won't matter what the operational success of the court is if the conversation around it completely suggests that it's a failure. Um, but. I'm not sure whether I agree with his solution, which is, oh, yes, let's just point out how complex the whole situation is. I paraphrase madly. Um, I've worked in this field for 30 years. I teach NGOs how to use Snapchat nowadays. Um, the media landscapes have changed fundamentally. The genie is out of the bottle. It is becoming more and more individualistic. It's becoming more and more fractured, the media landscape, the conversational landscape. Um, and my advice to the court is you have to equip yourself for it. Uh, when I look ahead and I look at the crime of aggression, I look at Iraq, UK, I look at Afghanistan, including the US, I look at Russia, I think, yeah, your first 20 years have been easy. You've only had Kenya. That's the only thing you've had to deal with that's been problematic, and, and Burundi, I mean, so what? Look at what's going to happen when the rest of the world starts to get its head around the fact of the ICC existing and how it can affect their national politics. Um, and please excuse me for the disrespect for, to Kenya and Burundi. I don't respect the, disrespect those countries at all personally, but in terms of the big geopolitical uh, effect of this court, you have your worst 20 years to come, and it's going to be very easy, interesting to see how you deal with it. I don't have a lot of personal advice, except that you need to start thinking about it now. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, our, our African colleague, yes. Thank you, Bill. I will speak in French. Uh, Ma question s'adresse à Lorraine. Vous avez brossé un tableau sombre de la participation des victimes devant la Cour pénale internationale. Euh, je voudrais vous poser une question. Je voulais savoir, êtes-vous d'accord avec euh, un professeur qui disait que les victimes à la Cour pénale internationale, c'est comme des invités, des personnes qu'on invite dans un restaurant alors que la cuisine est fermée. Je voulais avoir votre point de vue. So we will answer the questions when we, when we uh, at, towards the, the end. Uh, Philip, did you? Uh, 
Thank you. Um, yeah, Philip Ambach from the court, a victim participation reparation section. Um, I wanted to quickly go back to one thing that maybe rather uh, fits into the first panel that I read, and that is the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the significance of what the court statute, what the Rome statute has, has brought upon or brought about. And that is the fact that we do have victim participation and reparations in the statute, in the rules, in a way that is, I think, if you look at the other hybrid tribunals that we have today, surely the most um, well-defined, even though there is a lot of, uh, of, of leeway for the judges to find um, the procedure that they want. And I think that this is something we shouldn't forget from the perspective of its durability, because if you look at the hybrid tribunals, they do not have the funds to entertain the system in a way that the ICC can. The ICC has field offices where um, basically victim participation can take its origin. The ICC has a system whereby we have both internal and external counsel that can represent victims in the courtroom. Um, the ICC has a permanent trust fund, as we heard from, from Peter. Um, all these are items that also the hybrid tribunals have to an extent and you know you can look at the at the at the ECCC you can look at the Kosovo court you can look at um, maybe even the Central African uh, Cour Spéciale um, but the thing is that they will hit maybe um, I don't want to say a wall but a problem when it comes to how they actually put all this um, in in, uh, in action, because we at the ICC already now are facing a, a, a difficulty in making the system work which is permanent, where we don't just finance things for one situation, but for, for a plurality. So I think that one thing we have to keep in mind is the system that we've created is one that is potentially much more powerful than ad hoc solutions when it comes to, in particular, the victim perspective of things. And that brings me to the next point, and that is something that also came a little bit um, up in the, in, the, in the discussions, the um, lack of um, a unified approach on be that victim participation in terms of the procedural rights, be that the regimes by which victims are represented, be that the way that uh, reparations are being designed or put in practice. And I think here again, we should remind ourselves of the fact that we are at the beginning of something that is new, that we haven't done before. And yes, there is maybe a, a very good argument to unify as much as you can in order to have clarity in the proceedings. At the same time, let's be clear, the situations at the court are not all the same. And I think that there is a good argument to be made for different tailor-made solutions within the margin of the, of the law for the different situations that we have. And that really goes in particular also to the solutions that have to be found with regard to reparations. And I think the discussion is legitimate to see to what extent um, you can tailor make certain items. And then one last point, the entire system works with the trust fund being able to actually put in practice or put, make reality what the judges order. What the trust fund needs for that is funds. And if the trust fund is not funded, the whole system will stop right there and all the criti criticism that the court is receiving will be justified because in the end the victims will not get the redress that they're supposed to be getting. So again, here my appeal, um, the one that Peter maybe couldn't make because he is the trust fund, but now my appeal, please, dear states parties, think hard uh, if you have some spare cash um, that is one very good opportunity to make a system work for victims. Thank you. So, so uh, the, the gentleman here, I think it's Mr. Lewis. So. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill. I'm speaking here because I was a reporter at the Paris Intercessional on the Rules of Procedure and Evidence on Victim Participation and I was a sub-coordinator on the rules, amongst other things, on reparation to victims. For the reasons your last uh, speaker has uh, just, I think, very fairly explained, one of the things we tried to do in the rules was to give as much flexibility as we could to the judges to deal with the very different 
situations they would face. So that flexibility is important, but nonetheless, there is a downside to it. And I'm afraid from my experience in my domestic uh, life, um, what is absolutely clear to me is that predictability for victims and witnesses is hugely important. You must, if you're going to have successful outreach, it helps enormously if you victims and witnesses can anticipate how they will be dealt with. And it's almost impossible to do that without consistency of practice. Of course, there must be some discretion to tailor something uh, for the particular circumstances. But at the heart of it, if we really are to make the progress we want to see, there does need to be consistency of practice. And I think that is something the coalition can help the judges with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Human Rights Watch. Thank you. Um, I'm Liz Evenson with the International Justice Program at Human Rights Watch. Um, and I wanted to thank everyone, really, uh, for the very rich um, discussion, both yesterday and today. A lot of food for thought on so many topics. I just wanted to make a very brief comment about the, um, the challenge of assessment, assessing progress, um, how and against what. Um, and Mariana, Pena, Kim Prost, I think others, Philip also, um, you spoke to how important the permanence of the International Criminal Court is that that permanence is what um, really gives uh, hope for aspirations of independence, of one day of, of deterrence value, of being an embodiment of a commitment to accountability even when it doesn't seem, uh, well, when it seems that that's the exception rather than the rule. But I've sometimes wondered if the permanence has also been uh, somewhat of a limit on the imagination of the court um, because it hasn't really had to grapple with what its legacy will be. Um, and I, I think it's, again, a virtue of this system. You know, the ICC shouldn't be under pressure, political, budgetary, in the way that ad hocs were to wrap up their work too soon. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good quality. Um, at the same time, I think maybe one of the shifts going forward um, could be more of a sense uh, among this entire community, court, states, parties, civil society, what does the ICC um, set out to achieve in each situation country? And how will it know its work is done? How many cases, what kinds of cases, what kinds of positive complementarity measures should be there so that the court can leave? Um, I think if there's more focus uh, on what the ICC is trying to achieve um, from the outset when it opens a new situation, um, it will only enhance its work and it will make it, I think, provide a better basis for really assessing, assessing progress going forward. I think, um, to Daryl's point, I think the ICC is a victim of, of having so many different goals um, so it can always be failing, depending on which uh, goalpost is set for it. Um, but I think perhaps if there could be more consensus about what it's trying to achieve, where it is acting, that would help uh, in our reflection and, and ultimately in its success. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ha have to defer some of the other questions to the next session, and I'll try and keep you at the beginning of, of that process uh, so that we can not to get too far off of off of schedule and I guess uh, Daryl will begin with you and come back this way for responses um, I'll just take two first of all I agree with the journalist was it Janet was that yeah Janet um, I agree that pointing out uh, complexities is not the entire uh, solution but it is part of the solution among uh, some audiences um, but I also agree that we need to do more and I agree that um, there are stormy times ahead for the ICC um, the only other one is uh, I want to just underscore and agree with Bill that um, investigations are one of the paradoxical expectations put on the court. In Toronto, in Canada, um, there's a serial killer. He's killed seven people at least. We've put 100 police officers on that case. Um, so the ICC has to deal with much more gigantic crime bases with far fewer resources. Um, so the expectation from the public and from NGOs and from everybody is they want ICC investigations to be fast, cheap, 
comprehensive, um, without support, um, um, and meeting the highest standards of evidence, right? And that, that's not an attainable uh, goal. So um, the ICC, of course, should do what it can to increase efficiency, but I also wish they would just stop taking the punches at one point and say to the state's parties in the world, listen, quality, time, scope, cost, these four things are opposites, and you have to, uh, you have to choose, right? Exactly. Thank you. I'll just be very brief. Um, I just want to agree with my colleagues who spoke about the need to engage quite early, for example, in new situations. Um, in Afghanistan, we need to start thinking ahead. How are we going to engage with grassroots organizations in places like Afghanistan and make sure that there is, there is messaging, there is engagement with the victim communities there? Um, and not wait until we are too far into the process to really get them involved and to hear their views. I think that is critical. Um, the other thing is, I, if I'm, I hope I'm not misinterpreting your question, um, Eugène. David translated, so if there's anything, it's David's fault. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, you know, I, I do understand and I've heard that feedback that victims feel that they're brought in far too late in the process and that, you know, things are decided without effective consultation. I do know that the registry has tried to a large extent to engage victims quite early and although there are issues around the process of assigning legal representatives, I do know, for example, the VPRS has worked to try to engage victim communities, but there is still a lot to be done. And one of the issues is managing expectations as well. To what extent and at what stage do victims need to be informed? How much information do they need? We think that they should be informed as much as possible, but again, it comes down to messaging. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in this area, and I go back to my point that I said earlier, public information and outreach needs to be resourced. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to start with the Judge Monaghan comments and uh, link it with the victims issue, because uh, Judge Monaghan, as far as I've understood, she never told me, but I've understood that, spend a lot of evenings and nights to look into hundreds of applications from individual victims and it, to determine which, who, who was eligible for being a participant. And uh, having been one of those uh, individuals that wrote one of those known papers that ended up in the end of uh, our New Zealand friend here, uh, Felicity, who then uh, tabled it as a New Zealand proposal to make victims to participate in the court proceedings, Article 68, Paragraph 3, uh, all my thanks goes to judges like Judge Monaghan that made this thing happen. And let me also stress one thing, because here we are not to applaud to each other. The court also sometimes made a mistake in not looking at those applications. And it, did a, it decided to do so only in one situation, in two cases. It was Kenya. They were not looked at one by one. And we have seen also that's part of the... Un, of the, co of the causes of the consequences. There is always a consequence when you do a mistake. And this was part of the mistaken approach to that uh, uh, case that we need to learn from. Now, uh, are victims participating symbolic? They are highly symbolic, Eugene. They are highly symbolic. We shouldn't be telling them, you are a party to the proceedings. They are not a party to the proceedings. This is not a full system of participation as we know it in Parti Civil, uh, offended party in my own country and so on. So we need to be aware of that. Nevertheless, we need to fight to make justice relevant to them. And I go to the FIDH comment here, which is the most important one. How do we make this relevant to local NGOs, to victims? Um, Deborah made a, a powerful comment or now things are getting worse for human rights defenders. Let me just tell you what I've received yesterday from the man who made the Maldives a state party to the Rome Statute. Mr. Ahmed Malouf, who was at the time the leader of the youth of the ruling party and de-blocked the process. We had a meeting in London with uh, Akbar Khan when he was legal director of the Commonwealth. He introduced us to the Attorney General, who then introduced us to this member of the parliament to try to work with the parliament to de-block this. And Mr. Malouf liked so much the idea, came to a meeting with Judge Song in uh, Kuala Lumpur in uh, March uh, 2011. He went back home and in six months he convinced all his party colleagues to vote in favor of the ratification. 
He was with the government at that time. Now he happens to be with the opposition. So what happened to him yesterday? The police took him from parliament, put him up, and threw him out of parliament, slashed it on the floor, and two guards drove him away. He was just exercising his opposition rights. That's what's happening in the Maldives, in a country that ratified the Rome Statute. And one of the, why is it, why is it relevant to a Maldives human rights activist or to Mr. Malouf to be party to the Rome Statute is that if things would escalate, they could do the same that uh, Senator Trillanes of the uh, Philippines did, present a big dossier and bring it to the prosecutor here. Inter alia, of course, is one of the many, many, many things. We should never give the impression. This is the only court of, this is the, as I said before, this is the court of only resort. In the end of the day, this is one of the many avenues to make your uh, uh, facts, uh, not the post-truth facts, but the real facts known to an authority. So we need to be able to communicate that. And this brings me to the question that was placed by Judge Monaghan. The court needs to be able to explain to the ambassadors here how things are. You should have those type of, uh, I don't really think they are your principles. Because once you are voted as a judge, you are in the, una, an individual organ of the international community. You as a judge, you are an organ of the international community, at least of the state parties. But I believe, like Professor Trifterer believed, and I think we should remember today also, Professor Bassuni and Professor Trifterer, two greatest jurists who uh, helped creating this court. Um, that you represent yourself, you are a judge, and you represent the entire international community, because under the sixth considerando of the preamble, it is the duty of every state to end impunity for these crimes, and this is reflected in the preamble of the Rome Statute. So even though the preamble and the Rome Statute is on behalf of the state parties, there is a duty that is on behalf of every state. So you are performing the use puniendi on behalf of the entire international community. Explain it to the ambassadors. Find ways and means to meet with them over breakfast, and explain your job. It, it doesn't infringe on your independence. When you explain the mandate, you are free to talk. When you, and I want to finish here, uh, Bill, of course. <laughs> what are we doing for the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute, which I omitted to say in my few minutes? We are organizing the 20 consultative, the 10th consultative assembly of parliamentarians on the ICC and the rule of law, hopefully in the parliament of Ukraine in Kiev. This was a project that was started in 2002 in Wellington by Irving Kotler, who is in the room, I believe. Well, he was, here is him, a former uh, attorney general of Canada at that time, just an MP chairing our PGA group. It was an idea of Felipe Michelini of uh, Uruguay, who was just an MP at the time. Now he sits in the uh, trust fund for the victims. And um, the idea is to, have, to try to make this relevant to the global constituency of parliamentarians of the, of the world, the alike of uh, Mr. Trilanes, the alike of those who are promoting Morocco, Iraq, uh, uh, Solomon Island, uh, Jamaica, Haiti ratifications. Why not one day also Indonesia and Malaysia and other bigger countries? Ukraine itself should also ratify. We will use uh, Hans Korel's uh, Ukrainian handbook on the rule of law in Ukrainian. We, but you need to make it relevant, and you need to make it public, and you need to tell them, are you in or are you out? Do you want to join or not? And then it becomes costly to say no, because it's right. So the problem here is that you need to, bar, to raise the bar, also in the communication, in the dialogue, raise the bar, like Carla Del Ponte did when she managed to get Milosevic in The Hague, violating, getting Prime Minister Gingic violating the Constitution of Serbia, because he violated the Constitution of Serbia to make him travel to, you do have to so it's so linked, getting new ratification, getting cooperation, raise the bar, speak loud, have another strategy. We are trying to make our part. We want all together to, to, to raise the same, to reach the same objective. Thank you. Uh, I only in, in conclusion here want to make uh, two comments. One is that it is the, uh, prosecution, the registry, uh, the judiciary of the International Criminal Court. It is the Assembly of State Parties of the International Criminal Court. It is the Trust Fund for Victims of the International uh, Criminal Court. So I think uh, while there are three judicial organs, there are other organs that are uh, linked to, to the uh, Rome Statute and the International uh, Criminal Court. And the second is the issue of the financial strangling because this will this is going across the entire uh, 
international legal order spectrum where the biggest assessed governments are using uh, zero nominal growth and financial strangling to try to both politically influence the organizations and to undermine the organizations. And it is an extremely dangerous when you have an organization like the International Criminal Court uh, that is a standalone uh, independent uh, agency. So we really need to come back to a, a number of the questions of how do we try to strengthen the political support from the Assembly of State Parties to genuinely implement the, the Rome Statute through the ICC.